Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You've reached the No Name Cinema Society, the film review show that dares to dig a little bit deeper. And this is our sound off, the 51st time we've done this, our freeform segment. Hi, everybody. My name is Jonathan Betzler. I'm one of your hosts here for this evening. Uh, and I was here last Monday in Los Angeles for our Captain Fantastic review. Uh, and then to New York City uh, by Thursday for our classic Earth Girls Are Easy. And now I'm back to LA and boy, are my arms tired. Um, strangely enough, on Thursday when I was in New York City, one of the other members on that show was here in LA. Uh, and now that I'm back in LA, he's in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, the best looking member of the No Name Cinema Society, Devin Michaels, live from New York, the TV star. Why are we so out of sync, Jonathan? Oh, we waved in mid-flight. Our flights crossed mid-path. It was literally week. the same day. Crazy. So anyway, also with us, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the Freeform <laughs> segment, our sound off is from our 1970 in review, doing his second consecutive sound off and debuting his own segment this evening. Zach Domingo's here. Uh, hi. Welcome, welcome back, Zach. Uh, I didn't intend for that to be uh, a rhyme, but I'm gonna go with it. And uh, here is our schedule for this, which this has been our 67th series of episodes. Started about 10 days ago with a review of our current feature, as you can see there, and continued last Monday with a review of our indie spotlight, Captain Fantastic. And this past Thursday was our classic movie discussion, Earth Girls Are Easy. And tonight, of course, is our sound off, our freeform segment. And there you can see just some of the things that we're going to be doing on the show this evening. That is our schedule. You guys excited to do the sound off with me? Yeah, sure. So the next question is always, Free who's drinking ready. with me? I got a Legion Space Dust beer here. Who's who's joining me? Devin in New York. You're a drinker when you're in New York. You got it. You got rye. Excellent. I got some uh, whistle pig rye right here. Very good yeah. whistle pig. And I got to bring up the drinking slide here too, coming up shortly. And uh, Zach, are you drinking with us? Not yet. I might join you in a little bit though, because I think I'll need it. <laughs> 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 he's doing debuting his own segment. We got an obscure movie tonight. So he's nervous of how this night's going to transpire. So we'll see how that goes. But here is full screen now for the drinking slide. This is a game that you guys made up more or less. The fans, you sent us in some things that you like to drink to whenever I say all time contrived contrivance of verisimilitude. Zach would like to add the word diegesis to that. Whenever Zach says for real, real talk 100% or that's not a hill I'm willing to die on. And whenever Devin says there's something about that's when you guys drink. Precursory cheers to you, Devin, and to the drinking audience out there. We have to we have to add to my list because I've been pretty good about avoiding those three words ever since it became yeah part of the drinking game. I feel that. So, but why? why? Why would you want to avoid it? All right. Well, I'm going to say it every time now. Every <laughs> Patrick sentence. Patrick the same thing. As soon as the game came out, he's like, I need to curb this behavior. But I'm like... Audience is going to be so disappointed. Zach, you haven't tried to curb your behavior, have or you? We're just very, A very little bit. You point something out, and then you become conscious of it. It's like if someone does an impression of you, you're like, oh, no. Either way, it's time for our next segment. Very exciting moment. Zach's going to have his own segment. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Below the Line Report. Do -do 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 -do. Zach is now taking over this segment. And as a reminder for the audience, Above the Line is actors, writers, directors, and producers. Folks like Devin. Everyone else is considered below the line. Zach, so like us. Zach and I work below the line all the time, so he's the perfect person to do this segment. The last time we did this it was episode 62.4, in which we spotlighted cinematographer Ted Moore, who had shot the film from Russia with Love. Zach, you did the 1970 in review, so I understand you're going to take us back to 1970. Yeah, I'm going to bring it back to Scrooge, actually, which is a movie that we watched for 1970. And I think I'm the only person who liked it, <laughs> I think. Granted, it wasn't my favorite film, but Matt said it was his least favorite film of the year. I don't think you liked it very much either. Do I recall well, that correctly? I, I, I didn't like it, but I did call out a lot of its design elements. That's true. I enjoyed it for what it was. I went in with no expectations. But we all talked about how it had some pretty cool shots and also that the production design was very good so that's who we're getting into right now is the film's designer oscar winner terence marsh known in the industry as terry terry marsh was born in 1931 in london to a print worker and his mother sheila who sometimes worked as an extra on movies in england marsh went to school at wilsden college of technology in the early 50s where he studied architectural drawing and as a result his first job 
was a draftsman for Pinewood Studios. A draftsman, I just found this out, basically draws the floor plan of sets for the production designer and I assume for you know the construction crew and whatnot, so they have something to go off of. The first movie he worked on was To Paris with Love, starring Alec Guinness, as well as The Prince and the Showgirl, directed by Laurence Olivier, starring Marilyn Monroe, also shot at Pinewood. From there on, he worked as an assistant art director, starting with the film A Coming Out Party, which takes place in a German POW camp. His very next film as an assistant is one you might have heard of, Lawrence of Arabia, one of the most beloved films of all time, winning seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture in 1962. Marsh is also credited with building the city of Aqaba, which is as one of the most famous battles of the film. As a result, he is promoted to full art director under production designer John Box for David Lane's next film, Dr. Zvago, which is one of JB's favorites, in 1965, which Marsh would win his first Oscar alongside Box. As an art director, he then worked on Best Picture, A Man for All Seasons, a year later, and then he won his second Oscar for the film, Oliver, in 1968. Wow, this guy's like full of Oscars, man. He actually didn't get hired as the department head until our year of 1970 for the film Perfect Friday. I don't think I watched that one. Did we watch that? I don't know if you did. I didn't watch Perfect Friday. I didn't watch it. No one watched Perfect Friday. <laughs> we'll have to do an obscure movie vault on it. Yeah, I guess so. We didn't watch it. So his second film as a production head was Scrooge, which I'm only the person who liked in this whole group. JB named as the best production designer of the year. And that also got him another Oscar nomination. But this time as the, the head of the department. Uh, that year, he lost to Patton, which... We all watched and we all enjoyed. Oh, did you not like Patton that much? You were okay on Patton? Is that what happened? Warm on Patton, yeah. I, I, I feel like it's overrated it? for sure. Matt and I liked it though, right? I liked it. It made Matt's top five in 1970. Man, that movie is long though. I'll say that much. That was a long <laughs> movie. He was also nominated the following year for his work on Mary Queen of Scots with Vanessa Redgrave and lost to Nicholas and Alexandra, designed by his old pal, John Box. In 1975, he relocated to L.A. where he became tennis buddies with Gene Wilder and Mel Brooks, leading him to designing Brooks films, To Be or Not to Be, in 1983, and The Spaceballs in 1987. See, it's all about who you know, who you might be playing tennis with, you know? True. And yet you never play tennis with me, Zach. I'm already in your circle. I don't have to do shit now. <laughs> <laughs> Other notable films on his resume include The Hunt for Red October, Basic Instinct, and The Shawshank Redemption. This guy's got clout. His final film, strangely enough, was Rush Hour 2 in 2001, which he said was a completely different world than Lean. He said it was a lot of jolly schoolboys having fun, writing the script as they went along, which was not good for the art department. That's true. Um, <laughs> personally add into that as a below the line worker that if they're being described as a jolly schoolboys having fun doing things as they go it means it's really bad for everyone below the line. <laughs> and yet rush hour 2 made a lot of money and it was a great movie and i grew up on that movie so you know i love rush hour 2 but i'm glad that i wasn't around to work on rush hour 2 <laughs> in 2010 the art directors guild gave terry marsh their lifetime achievement award he died in January 2018 in the Pacific Palisades at the age of 86 after a four-year battle with cancer. That's our dude, Terry Marsh. Thank you so much, Zach. That was awesome. Thank you so yeah. much for that uh, great and thorough report. Um, uh, just a couple of notes that I have related to the show to tying, because uh, as you're listening, I uh, some things occurred to me. I mentioned that the only other time we did this segment, we spotlighted DP Ted Moore who shot from Russia with Love, which you were on the show when we reviewed Marshall. Yeah, Hill. I remember that. But Ted Moore won his Oscar as a DP for A Man for All Seasons. So it appears that they worked together on that Oscar winning film when Marsh was still just an art director. And of course, that's the best picture winner from one of the years that we studied, 1966. I also wanted to call out a film that you mentioned in which he was a draftsman, The Prince and the Showgirl, which was the film that they were making in the 2011 film, My Week with Marilyn, that I know Devin's a fan of. Uh, we reviewed it on the show, episode 28.2, and it made my top five actor biopics on episode 64.4, if you remember that, Devin. Yeah. I wonder who film. played Terry Marsh in the film My Week with Marlon. Do you think they cast somebody to play that part? One of the background actors might have been. <laughs> <laughs> we'll yeah, have to watch it again cool. in spot. There he is, yeah. that crosser. That's a draft yeah, right that's there. That's probably Terry Marsh. <laughs> 
In addition to A Man for All Seasons, it looks like Marsh worked on films from other years that we've studied on the show. You already mentioned The Hunt for Red October from 1990, but also in that same year, he did Sidney Pollock's film Havana, which I named as having a top five production design from 1990. And he also designed two films from our upcoming 1986 in review that we haven't watched yet. Miracles from director Jim Koof and Haunted Honeymoon directed by his buddy, Gene Wilder. So maybe Terry Marsh will make my top five production design list again. You have to find out in March of 2022. So it looks like it was a good choice, Zach, because we've encountered a number of films that he's worked on in one capacity or another. What a terrific career and legacy he had. Yeah, totally. I thought that was great. And it's been a while since I've been reminded of an old favorite to be or not to be. Fun, fun yeah. film. We did we did review that show, uh, that movie on my original show, Film Revision, which aired on PBS in 2008. That was when we were studying the films of 1983. So, uh, so yes, to be or not to be, uh, which was a remake of... Uh, 1942 film, which was Jim's favorite film of 1942, also named To Be or Not To Be, uh, with Jack Benny in the Mel Brooks role. So, Zach, great job. Thank you again for uh, yeah, for doing that. For sure. I love that segment, the Below the Line Report. That, that's some really good stuff. So, guys, we got an interesting little segment coming up now. It's a segment we've done before, but it's an interesting twist. It's time to open the vault, the obscure movie vault. This is a kind of an interesting situation here that we got back in late 2019. This is back when we were reviewing indies that came from 2009. And we all reviewed the film Downloading Nancy from director Johan Rank in episode 59.2. It's actually one of our most successful episodes that we've ever done on YouTube at press time, the third most viewed show we've ever had. It might have been Zach's very first show, actually, now that I think about it. Earlier this year, the writer of that film, Downloading Nancy, reached out to Devin and I to say that he saw and liked our review. The writer's name is Lee Ross, and he asked us if, if we'd look at another one of his films, an obscure indie from uh, 2015 called Benjamin Troubles. And so we, we thought we'd open up the vault to break down that film. And as a result, Lee and his downloading Nancy co-writer will join us for our first ever society interview in which the three of us, hopefully the three of us, will get to uh, talk to them about both films uh, in a, a Q&A kind of situation. That will be a very special episode, uh, the first of which we hope to be many more, and that is going to happen in a few days. Based on the fact that we're going to be interviewing these guys in a few days, we took a look at Benjamin Troubles, and that's going to be our, our obscure movie for tonight. My disclaimer is this. I didn't look it up, but my gut feeling is that this film is a lot lower of a budget than most of the indies that we review on the show, including Downloading Nancy. That doesn't mean I'm going to pull any punches, but given that all of us work on similarly budgeted films from time to time, as we've talked about, we know that it is a major accomplishment not only to complete a film with such limited resources, but then to find distribution for the film on top of that is a terrific thing. But as I've always said, once it's out there in the cinema watching world, it's fair game. With that, we proceed to our thoughts. I'm going to start with a quick summary, guys. It's not going to be a full review. It's one of our mini reviews, but I thought I should at least explain the plot to the audience because uh, it is an obscure movie. Um, so basically, uh, for Benjamin Troubles, it's about a down-on-his-luck artist slash ex-drug dealer. He's given a pair of jeans, which magically supplies a $100 bill in its pocket every hour on the hour, which simultaneously improves, but also complicates his life. How was that summary? Yeah, that was a good summary. All right, Zach, you, I don't know if it's been on camera or off, but you've intimated some feelings about the film. So I'll let you go first, just like general feeling. How'd you feel about it? I'm good. That's all I, mean. I think the suggestion here is he did not enjoy it. Am I putting uh, words in your mouth? Yeah, I did not enjoy it. I came in with a very open mind. I really tried to go along with it. It was not that coherent to me. The beats were weird to non-existent. It just felt like things were happening. Um, and I think there are a lot of choices that were made that I was very confused by. Uh, yeah, and, and we'll get into that. I'm going to break it down. Devin, general thoughts? Just thumbs up, thumbs down? Yeah, it, it mostly really didn't work for me. And there were some charming elements, but overall the acting was extremely uneven. The direction and the tone that it was going for didn't really find a way to get the themes to hit anything remotely in the same planet uh, as Downloading Nancy. Uh, obviously a very, very different film. Obviously this is mostly comedic and all that, but it was going for, for some real themes there and just didn't execute at all. So much for the concept of thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> that went awry very quickly. Uh, all I wrote for this section was 
to quote the film, I find it problemated yeah. is how I describe the film. I, you know, I always try to start positive as, as we do. And I, I will say that I thought that, uh, and it's interesting, I'm interested to see what Jack, uh, Zach, Jack, Zach has to say about this. I thought for such a limited budget and what appeared to be a lower end video format, the film looked pretty good from cinematographer Mark Schumacher, who sadly passed away after the completed production. I thought the interplay between light and shadow added shape and texture to the images. I thought exterior nights weren't overly lit as they often are at this level. The film often embraced the low light situations that I thought was appropriate and often visually interesting. There was one scene in a car where the punch in didn't match the master in an unfortunate and noticeable way. But other than that, I did kind of like the look at the film. Again, grading on a curve, given what they were working with. Zach, you're the uh, expert here on, you work in g &E a little bit. And starting positive, I liked the look of it. And the, unfortunately, the DP passed away, but I, I liked it. Yeah, I thought the below the line people did their jobs. They did it well. That's almost all I'll say on it. I think, I don't think any of the shots were anything to write home about, to be honest. I, I didn't talk anything about the framing or the- Yeah. Fair. Uh, or anything like that. Like I, cause I kind of agree. I okay. was impressed with the lighting on this level yeah. of it. Okay. For, for, I mean, the actual shots that had any lighting that wasn't just outside, Hey, we're in LA, we got to shoot this. Cause it's definitely a good majority of this movie. There are parts of the movie that just did not look that great to me that when there was actually, when it was lit, it was, it was noticeable to me. And I was like, Oh, nice. Actually. Yeah. Interesting. Well yeah, there. Devin, do you have anything on cinematography? I mostly just agree with with uh, what both of you said on that. I I, th I thought there was uh, an interesting look a lot of the time, considering the budget level. There was a fun, colorful motif that kind of matched better than a lot of other things that matched the kind of comic book uh, uh, running gag of introducing each character. Yeah. Um, yeah. There were aspects of the cinematography that kind of matched that colorfulness uh, of something kind of playful, uh, like those introductions were of of, the, of certain characters. But um, uh, yeah, but that that wasn't enough to save. The other oh ones. yeah, no, there's there's no doubt. I mean, yeah. I feel like you know you're in a, in a bad situation when I name the best thing about the movie is the cinematography. If you want to stick with positives for another minute, um, I, I, for the most part, and you know, coming at this from from an actor's perspective, um, for the most part, the two main romantic leads, I found their performances to be mostly good. That was my next positive, at least for the lead male. He's my next positive, so you can continue. Yeah, there were actually some very interesting little turning points in his arc that otherwise weren't really working because some of the other elements of the plot were really off track, but he was finding ways to show those turning points, even when they weren't necessarily written and give them some real heart. Both he and the lead actress had some real heart and some weight in what they were doing and some fun. But yeah, the, the rest of the cast was, was, was mostly missing the mark. I agree with a lot of what you said about the lead actor, Manu Interemi. I thought he was very charismatic and watchable. I don't think his range was ever really tested in the film. And I don't know if that's disagreeing with what you said or not. I will say he never, not once, really bumped for me. I particularly liked his banter with his best friend, played by Philip Andre Botello. Those I thought were the film's best scenes. They had the feeling of good improv, whether they were improv or not. I'm not sure that they are but they felt natural. And to your point, the same actor struggled in any other scene that wasn't those banter scenes. What I disagree with you is I didn't like the female lead as much, but to add agreement onto that, I couldn't really say much good about any of the other performances, but that unfortunately includes the female lead. I found most of the other actors in the film to be awkward, one-dimensional outlines of characters. They came off to me as untrained, less experienced, and unnatural. That could also be a lack of help from the director. My next note is ask Devin what he thinks, but it sounds like you've opined already. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I agree with that. There was one minor exception. One of the two corrupt Cops. law enforcement guys. They were a little one, over the top. One was not good at all, I thought, but, but the other one who I just looked up just now, Sean Michael Boozer, I thought he actually was showing some interesting restraint. He was grounding it in a way that the other performers in his scenes were not. 
I don't know if that was going against what the director was throwing out there. And obviously we're going to get to the director in a moment. We so are. <laughs> I did feel like he was a standout among the smaller characters. I didn't notice those same moments from him. I, I basically was like on train with the lead actor and almost nobody else except for the best friend in, in those improv scenes. Zach, do you have any thoughts on the performances or what Devin and I said? I think you guys are pretty spot on. I'll say uh, I didn't hate the best friend, but definitely had some pretty sour moments for me. But I thought in comparison with pretty much everyone else, he held his weight more. I don't know if I fully agree with you on the lead actress. Like I thought she was fine and that anything that I had issues with regarding her had to do with her character and probably direction. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue. Director Kai Efron is his name, K-A-I. We already have mentioned the lack of consistency in the performances, which falls on him to some degree, which I can also extend to the scene work. To me, they lacked any sense of verisimilitude, and that's a drinking word, everybody. So uh, grab your, your uh, wine, beer, and rye. Uh-oh, I'm out. Uh-oh. Um, and uh, also some rookie mistakes. Like, for example, and I, I think Zach and I have talked about this before, you should never shoot in between characters if you can avoid it. It messes up the eye lines, and he did it a couple times on purpose. Um, I also felt he inserted style unnecessarily here and there, like playing with speed of motion or freeze frames in the middle of scenes, which felt awkward to me in the edit. Uh, the occasional use of visual effects bump for me, the choice, not the execution. Bump is a really nice way to put that. Um, <laughs> right? I have to look up what year this movie was made to see if whether or not I needed to give it a pass on how the graphics were implemented and how bad they looked. It was 2015. I actually just think they were they didn't serve a purpose. Like it's more the choice themselves. No, you're super right. Then it was like a double whammy where not only did it not serve a purpose, but it looked really bad. I would use the word cringy. Just to throw it out, the last thing I was going to say about the direction is anytime there was an action scene, uh, whether it was fighting or gunplay, those scenes didn't work at all to me. And that was the final thing I wanted to say about direction. Devin, you want to add on to that? No, I mostly just agree with, with what you commented. Overall, like like the direction just did not did not drive this 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 ship. So it sounds like Zach will agree with that. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I disagree. I think the direction did drive the ship. It just drove it like how the Titanic was driven. <laughs> I, he, he just did like your metaphor. <laughs> Are you saying that he was aiming for the iceberg? Or... You know, watching that movie, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure because it, it went pretty hard like straight into yeah. it. Yeah, even though I was mostly joking when I asked you that, um, I did have a couple of moments, especially in the last third or so. Um, I did have a couple of moments when I started to ask myself, is this, you know, purposeful camp B-movie approach? Yeah. I think that's giving it a little too much credit. Yeah, I don't I think... No. Say, like That's some next level thinking that... Yeah. If he did, he didn't. He came up with the idea midway through. And that implies like a degree of self-awareness. I did not catch that. That's the last word I would use to describe this film. I do want to talk about the screenplay. And as the fans know, the number one thing I always complain about in screenplays, I'm going to try Devin first. What's the number one thing I always complain about, Devin? Gosh, what's the one? What's the number one? Zach, number one? I don't know. In this case, it's voiceover, and it's egregious here. Often explaining how the character is feeling or what he is thinking instead of cinematically letting us figure it out visually for ourselves. It robs the viewer of a level of engagement and is a storytelling band-aid or crutch. The other thing I hate about screenplays are contrivances, and we can drink to that one too, guys. That's another one of my words. The way oh, bad things strange. pile up for the character in the beginning to paint a picture of a guy down on his luck felt extremely contrived to me, and I immediately disconnected from the film as a result. And quite frankly, it was unnecessary. One just needed to see a man living on the streets or in a crappy apartment, or even just one of those things that happened to him would have been enough for us to feel like he was in bad shape. I suppose yeah. it can be explained away from the fable kind of tone the film seems to have, but I personally don't think that's a legitimate reason it didn't work for me. Uh, and the final thing on screenplay is world building. Something felt very false to me about the underworld Ben was involved in. Nothing felt real about the past in drugs or the underground poker games or even the love between the two lead characters or his interest in graffiti art. None of that felt grounded or real. 
And so like the characters, it just felt like an outline, a hollow version of that world that comes from other movies instead of actual research. And as a result, it didn't feel threatening or impactful or interesting to me. So guys, three things, voiceover, contrivances, and world building. Devin's nodding, so I'll let him go first. I agree on all three counts. I think that's a good way of describing where this went awry, all three of those areas. When you have to take your audience by the hand and get them started, I completely agree that it didn't trust us to get on board with less, you know, to, to give us just a little bit, and then we can do the rest with our imagination and with, with following a real grounded story, trying to pull it off in this playful way, but it was still just committing those same crimes of over explaining, giving us way too many examples. The actor was actually giving us plenty of that on his own. Just a small piece of what was there would have been enough. And then we could have gotten going. Um, and it could have been an hour and a half instead of an hour and 44. Well, maybe um, I would I would have used that time though in other ways. So I don't know if I want to shorten it as as, more, as much as repurpose that time. Zach almost intimated earlier at things that he didn't feel like were coherent because they kept cutting corners. For example, I didn't really buy the connection between the two lead characters. So one other scene, maybe a three minute scene between them, he starts making some sacrifices for this girl, doing stupid thing based on his interest in her with a very little foundation. And there's this whole montage that they use in voiceover where he's like. We talked about our plans and we talked about our future and he just tells us all these things and there's just images of them sitting by a fire and like show us a scene use that time to show us like an yeah. actual scene where they're having this conversation so it means something to us instead of telling us how to think and feel i don't know if it's about shortening it as much as repurposing some of that time for me personally otherwise it's insulting zach any of those things strike a chord with you yeah i it's just a problem because i have too much to say on this one to be <laughs> honest just go back to what you were saying you didn't feel the connection between the lead both of the romantic leads i didn't feel that connection with anybody there's no the whole gopher storyline of like why are these drug dealers suddenly want him so badly to be a part of this deal it's la is there literally no one else who's willing to work in a drug deal <laughs> like, within that same scene as if that wasn't terrible enough we have these two random cops who exactly like Devin was saying, we're just like, we're telling you why things are the way. But like, it's funny. It's like there was a lot of exposition coming from people's mouths without actually like feeling like exposition in any meaningful way. Because like, it didn't make sense. What they're saying didn't make it logical. It never sense. made sense. I didn't understand the laws of the pants because all of it was nonsense. That's the one thing it did well for me is it, it established the rules of the pants and it stuck to them at least. Yeah. I, I, no, I, 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 I let me say. I didn't understand that is what they were establishing in that scene when he pulls a tag out because all of it was nonsense to me. Oh, I see. You know, it was mostly the all the underworld stuff had very little logic. Such broad strokes, that whole scene. I mean, by scene, I mean like the world that created. That's what I was sort of referring to with the world building. It's not very detailed at all. So it didn't feel real. And so there's no foundation. So it was just a house of cards. Every time yeah. they came back to it, all of those scenes were on the weaker side. Where the film did its best was in things like the laws of the pants, right? That's where some of the themes started to shine through a little bit. Some of the wish fulfillment of being an audience member, watching a light movie about something like that. As I was watching it, I was like, well, that's actually, you know, a fun, interesting thing. That's one of the reasons why we like watching light movies sometimes. It's just this fun wish fulfillment and I'm gonna go, go along with that ride and see what kind of universal themes it brings up, either that make me laugh or make me feel something else. Whenever it was focusing on that, were some of the better times in the film. And whenever uh, it was focusing yeah. on almost any other aspect of the plot, it was making very little cohesive sense. So early on, I was wondering, why not go somewhere else, anywhere else, because you've got unlimited resources? Like, eventually that's what happened, but why not sooner? Like, that, I was like, just go. Why, um, why did anything happen ever? <laughs> I mean, if you're suddenly playing a poker game, that came out of nowhere. That was a huge plot point. All of a sudden, this is how we're going to make our money. After the fact, they tell us she's a great Yeah, and the player. last <laughs> one. Her stepfather's rich, so she's, it's not like she couldn't get staked for a game before this. No. You're right. It's all Did sort of he? wonky and weird. Um, I highly respect 
writers and that lifestyle doing that as a profession. I don't know how to temper how much I did not like this movie because I just didn't understand it. I always got what they were trying to do, but it was just always executed very, very poorly. The whole thing felt like a bad thesis film. I, Without a doubt. I think... Um, so I do want to get to... Devin's talked about the themes. Are you okay if I jump to the themes real quick? Uh... Yeah, can I just say one thing? Because I've been... I didn't know where else yeah. to fit it. I feel like I missed my boat on this. I have a note written down. This is the first thing I wrote down when I was taking notes. Movie starts with nonsense and people screaming. This continues for the entirety of the movie. The character never appears again. There's no. exactly. And, and, there's and she was screaming. And she was not good. But um, I just want to very quickly say that's, that's, that's set a bad omen for the whole rest, you know, in terms of the performances when she came out with that. But anyway, the characters in a movie, for the movie to work, either need to be much smarter than these characters were for it to be interesting or much dumber. And either way, it's interesting. Either way, it can be fun, but these characters seem to me to be right at that level of dumbness that, that, was, that was neither fun nor interesting. Yeah, every single I agree character. With that as well. Um, yeah. So what was, the, what was this movie about? Um, I used the word fable before, and, and so on some level, what we have here is a fairy tale about the corruptibility of money. As much as you can buy, Burdens, complications, and temptations come along with that. As the great biggies once said, mo' money, mo' problems. But I also wonder if there isn't something in the film about, paraphrasing Devin, something in the film about uh, magic. Not in the David Copperfield kind of way, but in the sense that sometimes just believing in something, whether that be magic genes, magic beans, a higher being, ghosts, or the power of positivity, sometimes the very belief is enough to provide hope, and sometimes that hope is enough to turn your world around. So those are some of the things that I took from the movie. Devin, is that sort of on par with what you were thinking? Yeah, I could see the screenplay trying to eke that theme out. And it did occasionally appear in a way that was starting to almost be satisfying, especially that theme about magic. The other themes I, I felt like didn't work. I don't think either but, really worked, but yeah, the magic worked better. Yeah, but at least the one with magic had, it, it seemed to match some of the charm and some of the heart that came from the lead actor's performance um, and that came from some other smaller elements of the screenplay that were trying to find their way towards the light. There's something about that that occasionally worked. It's something that overall failed to be executed. That's on the director too, to, to make some of those connections visually with his camera choices and shot choices, editing choices. That magic theme could have paid off if it connected to the father's illness. I there was, was thinking something it would about have you know, what happened with the father's, you know, bad heart, something about them believing in magic. And it was some connection there. I thought about that too. And then I'm like, is that trite to tie it together too patly? But you can do it. You can do it without making it feel trite. Zach, we pitched some themes at you. I know you're not a fan, but can we see those themes? Yeah, in the same way that I saw this movie. You saw the attempt, but they didn't land. That's a really nice way to put it. Yeah, there's a movie and it happens, so sure. You can literally tell me that about how this was a commentary on the Cold War. And I would just be like, okay. <laughs> sure. You mean it wasn't? If you want to write a thesis on that, I will read it and rewatch this movie. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. there is an element about capitalism, so maybe like there's some like some Cold War. Like, but like everything else, it never says anything or goes anywhere except yeah. to the end Agreed. credits Agreed. in Comic Sans. By Agreed. the way, which really bothered me. Zach, it's gonna be so much fun on that interview. No, it's gonna be terrible. I'm so terrified about that interview. Maybe we can get to the bottom of where it went awry, because to us it went awry. Maybe it doesn't feel like it did. I think it'll be fascinating, because it'll be we're discussing both films, so I think it'll be interesting to what Dev and I are going to ask some very positive things during the first section. And when we segue to Benjamin Troubles, it'll be an interesting twist. Anyway, is that ready to move on? So ready. He loves moving on. It's his favorite part. Speaking of favorite parts, it's the audience's favorite part of the sound off. Segment is for my top five and ten. We're gonna do a top five sci-fi comedies of all time, and you can drink to that if you so please. Because I said all time. This top five, of course, is inspired by a review of Earth Girls Are Easy that Devin, Matt, and I did a few days ago. My only caveat in advance is that after a long discussion with Patrick, whom I consulted for advice, we decided that Ghostbusters did not qualify as a sci-fi comedy. Comedy for sure, but sci-fi is a bigger question. I already had it on my top five action comedies of all time back in episode 36.4. So we're making that borderline judgment call 
that it's not eligible here. And I'm sorry about that, Zach. Thank you. I appreciate the apology. It's not accepted, but I appreciate it. Okay. I have to live with that. I also think it's worth noting that for some reason, every one of these films comes from the same decade. So that I didn't anticipate in advance, but it should be interesting. Zach, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. It's time for my number five. I'm going to start with the film from the year we are studying right now, 1986. The film takes place in modern times, but features a futuristic twist with the advent of technology in robotics. Zach, can you think about a 1986 movie that features robotics? A sci-fi comedy that features robotics? From 1986? I don't think so. Can I get a hint? I think 1986 robotic sci-fi comedy. It's a pretty, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Seven? Short Circuit. It is indeed. Short Circuit is my number five sci-fi comedy of all time. I rewatched it a couple years ago as Devin and I were preparing for a 1988 review because the sequel came out in 1988. So I rewatched this right before watching the sequel. A modern audience might reject the supporting East Asian character played by Fisher Stevens. But if you can get past that, you will discover a charming, entertaining take on the Pinocchio story. Steve Gutenberg and Ali Sheedy are at their most charming, likable best. Like its more serious counterpart, Blade Runner, Short Circuit is ultimately existential in using the fear of technology of the time to raise questions and perhaps open minds about what it means to be alive on this planet and how that time should best be used. Short Circuit, ladies and gentlemen, is currently available on HBO Max. Devin? Your mama was a snowblower. How do you feel about Short Circuit? <laughs> I agree with what I can remember. It's been so <laughs> long, and there's no good reason why it's been as long as it's been. I would love to revisit that movie. I remember having a real attachment to it, not just because of my crush on Ali Sheedy, which spans several films. I remember it having real heart. I remember being teary-eyed in a couple of moments of that film. And I think it is because of what you were mentioning about the authentic existential questions that it, that it puts out there and, and some of the other ways that it's charming and, and a good movie. And your girlfriend will have to watch it this year because she's doing the 1986 in review. So you might saddle up next to her. I know she doesn't like to cuddle during movies, but you can saddle up next to her and watch it with her if you so choose. Cuddling. I can watch it and cuddle with you, Devin. <laughs> All right. Story. I'm going to rewatch it. <laughs> Zach, have you heard of Short Circuit? You're a little younger than we are. I think I've heard of it. I've never seen it. Do you know the basic plot? No. You know, Steve Gutenberg and Fisher Stevens invent a robot. One escapes, and in living out in the real world, he starts to develop emotions. Oh, okay. This pertains to my interest. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on to number four. You guys good? Yep. All right, my number four, sticking with the idea of advancements in technology, I'm moving away from robots and instead looking at size manipulation. Ladies and gentlemen, my number four is Honey, I Shrunk the Kids from 1989 from director Joe Johnston. I screened this film at the Oscar movie marathon seven years ago for the film's 25th anniversary, and it was a huge hit, surprising one at that. Both for those of us that had seen it before, I saw it in the theater back in 1989, and for those seeing it for the first time, we were all surprised by the amount of real heart and depth brought to the high concept story. The performances by the kids are surprisingly great, even though, of course, Devin would have been a much better choice to perform in the role. Even them and the late Marcia Strassman are quite grounded, her in a supporting role as the concerned mother. And Matt Brewer offers great comic relief. The film is not only an ode to science, education, and family, but also the art of problem solving in a way that has the potential to inspire both kids and adults. Its charm, humor, fun, and heart makes this film a memorable winner. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is currently available on Disney+. Plus. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is my number four. Zach? I love Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, man. I love that. As a kid, I would watch it all the time. When I went to Disneyland, I'd go on that ride back to back to back. I love Honey, I Shrink the Kids. It's been a long time since I've seen it, and I feel like I should definitely go back to it. But yeah, that movie's friggin' awesome, man. Yeah, because I had only seen it as a kid, and watching it as an adult, I was surprised at how terrific it was. I'm glad you also enjoyed it. And no bones about it being on a sci-fi comedy list, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. So Devin, I, you know, I talked about size enhancement. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. You weren't at that screening in seven years ago, but I know you've seen the movie. I've seen it, but it's been a long time. I remember not being as into this movie as most of my peers at the time. I don't remember why it's been such a long time. I don't know if it was because there was another film around that same time 
that also played with size. I really liked Inner Space at the time. I did rewatch Inner Space for tonight, and I guess we can talk about this in the omissions. But I have a film from the same director coming up, and also it's so different of a movie. Like it doesn't have the same amount of heart. And to your point, when I was younger, I thought this was an okay movie, fun. I liked the ride. Zach pointed out at Disney World. Yeah. It was watching it as an adult that I realized that it was more special than I had given it credit for, I think, as a kid. As a more avid movie watcher as, as I am now, so maybe it is worth a rewatch. It's one of those weird quirks of human development, psychological development. Because I'm a couple of years older than you, with inner space, I was gravitating more towards the slightly more adult humor of inner space as opposed to the family humor of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. I was at that age where I was moving in that direction. I think that's probably why this this kind of fell off my radar that way. But I Absolutely. would be curious to, to see it now that I'm a full adult and yeah. And I can't remember if I said it or not. I just rewatched it. It's on HBO Max as well, Inner Space. And I just rewatched it just a couple of weeks ago in preparation for tonight. Prior to seven years ago, I would have easily said Inner Space was a better movie than Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. But having seen them now within a seven year period, which is still a long time, but I would lean towards Honey, I Shrunk the Kids because the heart is there and a lot of those other things that i talked about in terms of education and science they're woven into the fabric in the movie in a more meaningful way than some of the things that inner space tries to do I, I like inner space don't get me wrong it's time for my number three uh, my next film came up earlier from zach because it was designed by none other than terence marsh zach any guesses as to what my number three sci-fi comedy would be de designed by terence marsh you did mention it no what year was it 1987 no, I don't know. Uh, so I thought he would guess it, but he didn't. Ladies and gentlemen, my number three sci-fi comedy is Spaceballs. Oh, uh, duh. Yeah, okay. Spaceballs, directed by Mel Brooks, the tennis partner of Terrence Marsh. I couldn't in good conscience keep this film off the list. Even though its science fiction elements are obviously derivative, it's so damn funny. It is easily the best spoof of Star Wars ever and continues to make me laugh even though I've seen it 1,001 times. It takes a great deal of intelligence and detail to create something as iconic and hilarious as this film. And of course, it has something big in common with Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Zach. Terrence Mark? No, I don't know, what? what? Rick Moranis. Rick Moranis. Whoa, yeah. Rick Moranis had two films back to back on the sci-fi comedy Zach, list. Zach doesn't notice above the line people. I don't. <laughs> I don't. They don't notice me, so I don't notice them. I'll tell you who my favorite grip was on that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> Without looking it up to tell me the best grip on that movie. Anyway, Zach, I'm sure you've seen Spaceballs. Yeah, of course. Classic. You're still happy with the list. It's so far so good. So far, so good. I have a feeling I'm going to have something. I'm, I'm going to be upset that you don't have something on there. Okay. Well, I've got two more left. So, I mean, he's already predetermined what's going to happen. He's probably well, right. in the same, all in the same decade. So yeah. I didn't plan on that, but it's true. I have a feeling I know the one you're... I have a feeling you also know which one I'm going to say. Anyway, so yes, Zach thinks it's a classic. Devin, where are you on Spaceballs? It's, it's, it, it occupies such a unique position in so many of our lives uh, for different reasons. But it occupies a unique position in my life because of the whole Schwartz thing. Oh, right. Uh, you know, oh, my God. My, my, but I mean, uh, like, the, the audience doesn't know what you're referring to. Yeah, I was about to explain. So uh, I'm, as an actor, I'm Devin Michaels. That's, that's my name in the union for decades. My legal name growing up is Devin Schwartz. And uh, it was an early agent who, you know, had me change it to, to be more generic or whatever. It's such a pain in the ass when a huge, iconic blockbuster movie gives every single person who meets you or knows you at school a reference to mock or poke fun at in some way. It becomes boring after a while, and it's hard to, to extricate your experience of the movie or your memory of the movie from the experience of hundreds of people that I've met over the years. And they say, oh, may the Schwartz be with you. And I'm like, that's really original. <laughs> you know? It says something about the movie that it'd be that iconic. And I recognize that, and I can't be objective. I, I, I recuse myself on that basis, and I recognize its place um, uh, in our in our lexicon and, and um, on this list. And on this list, um, <laughs> I you know I, again I I do recuse myself, but uh, <laughs> but at the same time, if you if you want a, a quick comment, I I don't know if it would make my top five. I always felt like there were too many misses. There's a lot of hits. There's a lot of big jokes, but there's also a lot of jokes 
that I feel cheap in it. I've always felt this about Mel Brooks. The only movies that I feel are exempt from this criticism are The Producers and Young Frankenstein. But outside of those two, including his big famous ones like this and Blazing Saddles, I find there are too many misses. There are too many jokes that I feel like should have been on the editing room floor because they don't quite work and they don't rise to the level of the rest of the jokes. And I feel that way about, about this, this movie. I, 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 I respect it. I think there's a lot of hilarious moments and I respect its place in, in, in our cinematic lexicon uh you know but it's 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 not top five for me i don't think i'll say it's success rate joke wise is a lot higher than most comedies i see especially spoofs when it comes to parodies they're often hit or miss I, you know i put naked gun ahead of this i put airplane ahead of this if it was a spoof top five this would make that list as well there's a lot of hits I think 80 to 90% hits for me. I don't want to go through with the large comb. I don't want to comb the desert with it and count each one that worked for me, but I thought there's a ton of hits for me. Zach, do you have a comment on what Devin said? I understand where he's coming from. I think it's a very fair assessment. It doesn't change the fact that I still love Spaceballs, but I would say Young Frankenstein is, I mean, obviously it's not going to make this particular list, but like, oh, yeah, it's definitely a better movie. I, I lean towards, I love Young Frankenstein. I, lean, I do lean towards Spaceballs, but the other one I love, Mel Brooks-wise, is To Be or Not To Be, which you brought up earlier. I like that movie better. That has been established. Um, all right, guys, it's time for my number two. Um, and this is a director of this next film, had a couple of sci-fi comedies that I considered for this list. But to me, this one towers above them all. And one of them is Innerspace. So this is the same director as Innerspace. It's one of the entries in an 80s subgenre of what Devin and I call preteens in peril films. Films like War Games, Space Camp, Flight of the Navigator, Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L, and this film. And I'm turning back to the thing. This is, ladies and gentlemen, Explorers from director Joe Dante. First of all, most of it is played straight. They feel like real kids in a real town that have some extraordinary things happen to them. To that end, the three kids, including a young Ethan Hawke and a chubby, unrecognizable River Phoenix, have outstanding chemistry, which goes a long way in selling it. Secondly, the science all checks out, at least as far as knowable science is concerned, in terms of gravity and power and airwaves. It's just extended a little, which is the best way to do science fiction. Finally, and most importantly, not only is it entertaining and compelling, it winds up being satisfyingly important as well, in the most subtle way possible. While it beautifully captures the power of imagination and ingenuity of youth, it gives it a reality check, reminding us that nothing will ever live up to the perfection of our goals and dreams, and the knowledge and or acceptance of that can spare a great deal of heartache and frustration. Secondly, it suggests the not always positive correlation between mass media and culture. By suggesting how aliens misinterpreted our media output, they hint at how generations of present and future humans can also do the same and how the violence, racism, and sexism of past cultures might influence the next generation. In the most Dante-esque way, we are reminded that the movies aren't any closer to reality than the dreams are. Explorers is unique in that it attempts to poke holes in a lot of the Hollywood mythos and ground us, particularly the next generation. Explorers is currently available free on Amazon Prime, but it may not be for very long. So I'm going to go to Zach first because it's possible he may not have seen this one given his age. Zach, do you know Explorers at all? No, I have never heard of this movie which makes me more upset that you will not have the movie I was thinking on the list. That movie is my hill to die on, so... Uh oh oh he's going to have a hill to that die is, on. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I love Explorers. Uh, we, this is our subgenre, so I'm hoping you've seen this movie, Devin. I have, but first I have to very quickly say that if, if Zach does have a hill to die on here, that means we have to do the opposite of drink. Throw up. Spitting no. it out. To spit you gotta, something out or you gotta buy me a drink. Very, you have to speak very soberly for the rest of the show. I don't remember details because uh, it's been a, a lifetime, but I do remember liking this film uh, and seeing it a couple of times when it first came out. Uh, but I just, it's been too long, so I, I can't say much more about it. Even in watching as an adult, I think it's extremely special. And uh, the bonus points is, as, as common as a theme with me and being about something and being funny and charming and entertaining as well. Uh, I think it's really important for kids. It's one of the better kids movies. It's really fun, but also beautiful. It's a really, really special movie. I'm really glad to hear that it's on Prime. I'd love to rewatch it and see what memories it, it brings back. I found tons of people rediscovering it online on YouTube and other things. Shows like these, people are finding this movie and recognizing a lot of the qualities that Joe Dante was exploring. Ah, 
I didn't mean to do that, but mining in this particular film. I'm excited that I'm not alone in this one. Zach, I know you're upset that your movie is not going to be on here, but I'll, you know, I'll check it out. Sometime. If you watch Explorers, maybe you'll, maybe you'll agree. I don't know if it's because we grew up with it. I'm not sure, but it was special at the time, but even more special now, I think. All right, so it's time for my number one movie, guys. So in these films, we've seen robots, shrink rays, and space tra travel. Um, so with that in mind, if you're thinking about sci uh, if you think about sci-fi, time travel would also qualify. And with that in mind, only one film can be considered for this first position on this list. Currently listed as my number 14 favorite film of all time, and I believe is Matt Polis's number one favorite film of all time. Any guesses, Devin? Really? Zach knows. Back to the future. It has to be, ladies and gentlemen. Back to the Future from 1985, my number 14 favorite film of all time. From director Robert Zemeckis, whom I named as the best director of 1988 for his work on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But what can I say about Back to the Future that hasn't already been said? It's close to perfect from all disciplines. Directing, acting, writing, design, music. It's this absolutely joyous melding of past, present, and future, and in doing so, forces us to look at generational gaps and also how deeply the events of yesteryear can affect the people we become if we let them. And as the butterfly effect suggests, one small change in that timeline can affect our whole outlook. Why is it that one insult or one punch in high school can change our whole sense of self-worth that we carry with us our whole lives, either empowering or more often than not debilitating us in our future endeavors? But showing how one event, one burst of confidence can so easily shift the trajectory of someone's entire life the film minimizes the weight those incidents need to have. It's the power that we give them. The time travel elements of Back to the Future films have been called into question by science, but none of that really matters. As a film, it's a glorious near masterpiece that sings with joy, fun, charm, and intelligence. Uh, so Back to the Future uh, Kids is my number one sci-fi comedy of all time, number 14 favorite film of all time. A lot of people love it. Mass Pulse's favorite film of all time. Zach, you were able to guess it. Yeah, it's Back to the Future, man, of course. You know right away it was going to be number one on this list before before I even started? No, not necessarily, because I think with you it could go either way. You either love it so much or you think it's contrived. <laughs> I'm never sure, um, but this seems like a JV movie. It's a great movie. It's a classic. If you haven't seen on Netflix the movies that made us, it's a very flawed series, but there's an episode in Back to the Future, and it's very, very good if you're interested in behind-the-scenes pre-production kind of stuff. Cool. I definitely am. Devin, you didn't guess this amazingly. I thought you would have it. No problem. My brain doesn't work that way. I'm not good at pulling things off the top of my head from categories like sci-fi or comedy or sci-fi comedy. Now that you've put it in front of me, of course, it's an obvious choice in a good way. I completely agree. I can't think of anything that I would place above it. There's a reason that it is literally used as a model of what to do for screenwriters and all the other elements that you mentioned and how well executed it is. It's 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 a great, 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 great movie. All right, so this is this is gonna be Zach's moment here. Um, there's an obvious omission that I can think of, and, a, and I, 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 I'm gonna guess for Zach what I think he's thinking of in terms of yeah. sci-fi comedies that I'm missing. Yeah. Uh, Zach, I think that you're upset that I don't have Galaxy Quest on this yeah, list. Yeah, I'm so upset. I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. Thinking it would make the list, I rewatched Galaxy Quest for this, and couldn't in good conscience do it because of the power of some of those other films like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and, and obviously Explorers and Short Circuit. I was not as enthralled with Galaxy Quest at this most recent viewing, although it was on an airplane that I watched it. The movie is cute and fine, sometimes funny and certainly worth a couple hours of my time. But the contrivances, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, you just mock me for using that word, the contrivances do pile up. And one was fine, but then it just kept going and going. It felt like the screenwriter trying to flex their cleverness but it prevented it from rising above slight entertainment for me. I thought the cast was great, notably Sigourney Weaver and Enrico Colatini. Everybody was game for what the director's trying to do. I feel like the real space never looked different enough from the TV show. Like I understand why the ship wouldn't, but everything else looks as dated as hokey as it was on the TV show. And I, I feel like there should have been at some point a line drawn. And along the same lines, there never really felt like there was any danger. And, and it's tricky because the film wants to be a comedy, but it's not quite funny enough and therefore those little other flaws loom larger. If you really think about it, it's kind of a one joke movie that's recycled over and over again, which admittedly never gets tiresome, but it comes 
close. Highly subjective. I understand what you're saying. I don't agree with most of it, but I can see where you're coming from. This is the hill you're going to die on. That's the best oh, you're going to yeah. do. <laughs> this is 100% the hill I'm going to die on, but I'm giving us both a little room here and saying that like part of it is that's the movie that I grew up on. I just think that movie is so charming and well put together and it's just like a joy from start to finish it's not a perfect movie but i think everyone's great in it alan rickman's character is awesome i think there's like legitimately emotional moments yeah no i love galaxy quest so much and it is a hill i'm willing to die on because i think it's there's so many people have not seen that movie especially people in like right. my generation would you put it ahead of back to the future not necessarily i mean if if i was doing like a top five of all time i would put it pretty high up there i think it would be top three for me at least so, i mean like i think it's a good movie for sure like and i hope i didn't suggest no, cool. otherwise i just don't know if it's a great movie i like galaxy quest a lot i think it might have made my top five if i sat down and rewatched honey i shrunk the kids and a couple of the other ones you had on there it, it might have beat them um i think it would probably beat space balls for me i'm not sure if I would put it at four or seven, you know, I, I do like Galaxy Quest. Devin, any sci-fi comedies on your mind that I, that you were expecting that I may have missed? Not off the top of my head, but um, I will quickly say that um, uh, I know for sure that Kelly will be upset about the omission of Galaxy Quest. But will she say that knowing that Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Back to the Future, Spaceballs, and Short Circuit are on it? I have a feeling that it might beat all of them in her mind. She has to watch Short Circuit for a 1986 interview, so we'll see. We'll see about that. But uh, yeah. but Kelly's a similar age as Zach, so that makes a lot of sense. All right, guys, I'm going to close things out. It's been a very long and powerful sound off, lot, covered a lot of ground. Zach, how do you feel about the evening in general? I thought it was super productive, and I'm glad we all talked. And, I'm, I, yeah, I think we all, we all learned a lot. I think the real money, money, producing pants was the friends that we made along the way. <laughs> and did you have fun at least? Yeah, I always have fun. Devin, how did you feel about tonight? It was an adventure as always. And guys, we hope to be back soon to kick off our 68th series of episodes. And we reviewed no other director more than Steven Spielberg. And we will add on to that, hopefully, if we get our stuff together on Thursday, December 16th, 2021, when we review the current feature, Steven Spielberg's remake of West Side Story. And that'll kick off our 68th series of episodes in a couple of weeks or so. And we're all looking forward to that. All right, so that's coming up, uh, kicking off our 68 series of episodes. Um, so uh, time to say goodnight. Say goodnight to the audience, everybody. Night. Zach's waving. <laughs> Good night. Good night. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned. <laughs>